Hey, good evening. One last time. I am so thankful to be here. It has been very good, a joyous time to get to know some of you. How many of you were here for every service? Well, there's quite a few, praise the Lord. Uh, about 25 years ago, an evangelistic team with two large families and their whole entourage called the Merrill Evangelistic Team. You've heard of them before. They came to preach at our church where I was pastoring. The music was exciting. The preaching was fiery. And after one of the meetings, one lady in my church came up to me and said, Pastor, now that's how you're supposed to preach. I was glad for the advice. But if I was to take a survey tonight, just of this room, and ask you this question, what do you think preaching should be like? I'd get several answers. Somebody might say it needs to be short and to the point. You know, that's not my opinion. Probably not your pastor's opinion. Somebody might say preaching ought to be meeting social needs. Somebody else says it should never be condemning. Another person says it should be entertaining. Somebody else says it should be deep so as to teach, really teach a deep truth. Somebody else says it should be basic, not over anybody's head. Another person says it needs to be to the point. Another person says it needs to be vague so that you don't offend anybody. Another person says it needs to be about good things, not bad things. Somebody else says it needs to be about the good in all of us. One person says when a preacher preaches, he needs to pound the pulpit to draw attention. Somebody else says preachers should never pound the pulpit because that distracts from the message. Somebody says preachers ought to raise their voice and preach. Cry out against sin. Somebody else says Preachers should never raise their voice. That's not professional. Somebody says you need to preach like Randy Merrill. You need to preach like Pastor Dan. You need to preach like Lester Roloff or Mark Minnick. Well, you need to preach like Charles Spurgeon did. You need to preach like Billy Sunday did. Break chairs over the pulpit. You need to preach like Bob Jones Sr. did. One man said, my pastor was preaching, and when he was preaching, he hit that top part of the pulpit so hard that his fist went through it, and his fist, the pulpit came up with his fist. And then the man said this, and this is the title for the sermon, for those of you up there. The man, after he said his preacher did that, and he said, now that's preaching. There was a common thread about every one of those things. They all had one thing in common. Do you know what it is? They were all opinions. Our concern should be not necessarily to copy a style or somebody's way of preaching, but our concern should be, what does God's word say? There was one preacher in Indiana, a famous preacher of a church of 20,000 people. When he preached the word of God, he would, ha, ha, hum. He would uh, uh, clear his throat quite a bit. The reason why he cleared his throat when he was preaching is he had some type of a throat problem. He was constantly getting some type of uh, throat bacteria or something along that line. And he was often on medication for it. So when he would preach, uh, uh, um, let's turn in our Bibles. And he would preach like that. Young men that studied under him, many of them, would do the same thing, yet there was nothing wrong with their throats. They just thought, that's what preaching is supposed to be like. And they would stand up and they would go, ha, ha, hum, turn it into ha, ha, hum. Another preacher, a famous evangelist, when he went to the preaching, he would take his jacket off. I mean, it's a beautiful jacket, but he would take his jacket off and then he would roll up his sleeves. <laughs> 
And everybody that's studying under him would take their jacket off and roll up their sleeves because that's how you're supposed to preach. I'm guilty of the same thing and the same thing that I, I do when I was in my 20s and I was watching my pastor. I noticed he did something when he preached and I thought, that's what you're supposed to do when you're wanting to emphasize the point. So I started doing it. My pastor was Pastor Kern. He would stand at the, he was at the same church for 57 years, or 56 years, 1961 to 2017 when he went to be with the Lord. And here he was, he'd preach, and he'd stand at the pulpit and preach, and you knew when he was about to drive a point home, he would step back from that pulpit, and then he would come forward and preach his point. And he did it every time. So when I started preaching, I started stepping back from the pulpit and started going forward when I wanted to prove my point or make my point. In the early 1980s, or mid, around 1983, 1984, I was assistant pastor in southern Indiana. While I was the assistant pastor there, for the summer of 83, then I came back in 85 and 86, there was a night which when everybody came to church, right after we got there, a big storm hit. The electricity went out. We scavengered around the building, found as many candles as we could find. We put the candles all over the building. There were several behind where I was preaching, and I was the preacher that night, and they were all over the building on the sides and in the back so that we could see a little bit, especially up front where I was preaching. And during my sermon, every time I went to prove a point, I went back. The entire congregation went like this. I thought to myself, wow, they're getting this message. I'm really preaching. And every time I went back again, after the service was over, everybody told me, you know how many times you almost caught this church on fire? But that's what I thought I was supposed to do. There's a command to preach in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to look at that command to preach for just a few minutes. If you want to head that way. And I want to make sure I don't have a dry sermon. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. In verse 2, the Bible uses, starts out with this word. Preach the word. Be in season, in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Titus, Paul said in Titus chapter 1, But hath in this due time manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. I have a command to preach as a preacher. Several times in the Word of God, the Bible uses the word preach, and it's for all believers. It's the word that where we get our word evangelize. But there's a particular word for preaching that is for the preacher in the pulpit, and we're going to find it in this passage. It's from the root, a root word that means to herald, like a public crier. So what is a herald? A herald was one that spoke the mandates of an authority, usually a king. A herald in ancient times, that's H-E-R-A-L-D, like hark the herald angels sing. A herald in ancient times was a direct communicator from a ruler to their people when communication wasn't always possible for the king or the ruler to be there. The rulers used these special officials called heralds to deliver their message, give their orders, announce special events or special laws throughout their kingdom. During the Middle Ages, heralds became personal agents of the king, and it was literally a crime to interfere with their work. They would go to a crown, uh, to a certain town, they would stand up upon a podium, and they would roll back a scroll, and then they would let their voice be known, Hear ye! Hear ye, the commands of the king, the mandates of the king. Their responsibility was to grab the attention of the people 
and not let it go, and the responsibility of the people were to keep their attention on the things that that herald was saying. God has always lifted up men to speak with conviction and authority because God gave the authority. I'm going to mention several preachers. That doesn't mean that I agree with 100% of what all these preachers have ever said or done. I mentioned a couple last night, and somebody asked me about those men. I don't agree 100% with everything of those preachers. But Chrysostom was called the golden mouth because of his eloquence. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was called the prince of the preachers. Billy Sunday was called a human cannonball because he exploded with conviction when he preached the word of God. Why? Because they preached with authority. Not their own authority. They were the heralds preaching with the authority of the king. They received a mandate from an authority. In Mark chapter 1, the religious rulers of that day, of Christ's day, were astonished at the doctrine of Christ. And the Bible says in verse 22, Because for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. When we read about the Great Commission, the Bible says, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That particular word for power is the word for authority. The Bible was originally written in the Greek language, and when it was translated into our English Bible, sometimes there's one Greek word that is translated more than one English ways, and sometimes there's... Uh, one English word from many Greek words. One of those is for the word power. When we read in the Bible, but as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons or technion, little children of God, even to them that believe on his name. That word for power there is the word for authority. And then when we read in Romans chapter 1 where the Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, that's a different word for, the, for power. It's the word dunamis, sounds like dynamite. It is talking about that power that God has because of the work of Christ to destroy the bounds and bondage of sin over an individual. So one means authority. One means power. It's even used in the context of military strength. That type of power. The President of the United States is called the most powerful man in the world. And if you ever, I like lifting weights. I like power lifting and things like that. But if you ever saw Barack Obama lifting weights, he was the most powerful man in the world holding three pound dumbbells in each hand. I wouldn't call that the most powerful man in the world. But as far as his authority was concerned, that's what made him powerful. These young people don't have authority to go into the White House, but whoever the president's children are or grandchildren, they have authority to go in there, and that's the word for power. So power here, when the Bible says in this passage, that all power is given unto me, Jesus says. He's talking about authority. And the Bible says that he taught them as one that had authority. And the command to preach for the preacher is one that comes not from our own authority, but from a higher authority. There is a command to preach. Secondly, there's a message to preach. Preach the word. Peter said it like this. If any man speak, let him speak the oracles of God. Second Corinthians 2 says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we Christ. Several years ago, a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, sent me a book. He said, Lloyd, if you follow the principles of preaching that are taught in this book, your church will go into the thousands. He said, you'll have over a thousand, maybe over two thousand people in your church. And the principles of that book taught that you need to preach according to the emotional or what they call the felt needs of the people sitting in the congregations. 
They say the churches that use that concept of preaching the Word of God are literally growing by leaps and bounds all over the country. Because they know that when they walk into the church, that sermon is going to be about their felt needs, the things of their emotional needs. The problem is with that, that when they, they come in, they're too busy thinking about themselves 7, 24, 7. Then they come to God's house, and instead of getting help from God's Word, again, they're focusing on self. It's a responsibility. The message is not the felt needs of individuals. The message is, thus saith the Lord. There is a man, I hope this doesn't offend anybody, because if it offends you, it shows a lack of spirituality or discernment or understanding of spiritual things. But in his book, Self-Esteem, pages 36 to 38, you can read Robert Schuller says, we don't start with the Bible because too many people differ over what the Bible says. We don't start with God because people different have different opinions about God. He says we start with self-esteem. That's the problem. That's why there's not change in the life. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But all to us that are saved... It's the power of God. And it uses the word dunamis there. We preach Christ crucified. And if you come in and have your focus and attention on self, and you leave with your focus and attention on self, it hasn't done you any good. But if you come in with your focus and attention on self, and you leave with your focus and attention on the eternal word of God, and on the God of the Bible, it's done you all the good that you could get out of that time. It's the Word of God being preached as it is to people as they are. And when that happens, and you focus on Him and not self, all of a sudden you realize along the way your emotional needs are met. And they're met in Him. And they're met in His Word. They're not met in focusing more upon your Special needs. Over 3,800 times our Old Testament uses the expression, Thus saith the Lord, or the word of the Lord came. When I was in school, I remember some things, and after school, I remember one, some things that one of my mentors taught me. He said, when you're preparing sermons, if you look at the sermons of the Lord, and you look at some of the other sermons in the Bible, you'll see that there's three main parts. Explanation, illustration, and application. He says you need to make sure you do all of those. People need the Word of God explained to them. That's explanation. They need it illustrated to them. Jesus did that with the parables. Those were illustrations. So we need it illustrated to us, and then thirdly, we need it applied to us. Not just leave people with, here's what the Bible says. Some don't even do that. They don't even tell you what the Bible says. They just meet the felt needs. Not just, here's what the Bible says, and here's an illustration of what it says, but here's what the Bible says, here's an illustration of what it says, and now apply it. This is what you need to do with it. Do something with the Word of God. So, Paul tells Timothy in the passage that we're looking at, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We're going to deal with those three words briefly. The pastor said he wanted to schedule me another time. You heard that when he was up here a few minutes ago. Publicly stated. So, I guess we're coming back. So, I don't know what that date was, but just let me know. But anyhow, three words. Reprove. Reprove means a gentle warning. It's the same word that's translated convince. The preaching of the word of God sometimes brings a gentle warning. Sometimes it convinces somebody. It's also translated convict. It's translated to tell one's fault. 
Another famous preacher said it means helping a person to understand that what he believes or what he's doing is wrong with careful biblical argument. You're doing something wrong. In the words of a famous lawman, nip it in the bud. That's basically what her proof is. You're doing something wrong. Rebuke is stronger than that. Rebuke is... It's more than reproof. Another famous preacher said reproof discloses the sinfulness of sin, where rebuke discloses the sinfulness of the sinner. This is now part of your life. Whatever this is that you're doing, whatever it is that is wrong, is part of your life. And reproof is more of a convincing, it's more of a challenge, a charge to change. Someone who starts by to backslide from the Lord needs more than a mild reproof and a reminder. The word backslide is found 17 times in the Old Testament. If someone is determined to backslide and stay backslidden away from the Lord, they need rebuke. Young people can be used of the Lord. My challenge to the Christian school the other day was about young people leading others to Christ because... A young person led me to Christ. There was a young man named Charles Spurgeon during his first visit to Stamborn. He heard his grandfather lamenting time and again over the inconsistent life of one of his flock. And one day he suddenly declared his intentions to kill the man. The man was named Old Rhodes. Just a young person Spurgeon was. You know, young people over here. Spurgeon was a young man, and he knew that old Rhodes was causing a lot of grief to his grandfather, who was the pastor. And so he said, I'm going to kill old Rhodes. In spite of the warning his grandfather gave him about the awful fate of murderers, he persisted in his resolve, I'm going to kill him. I won't do anything bad, but I'm going to kill him. Shortly afterwards, he astonished them by asserting he had done the deed. In answer to all of the questions, he declared, I've done no wrong, but that the deed has been done. He said, I did the Lord's work, and I killed old Rhodes. And old Rhodes is never going to trouble my grandfather anymore. Finally, the mystery was solved by the appearance of Old Rose, who shortly afterwards called at the manse and told how he had been sitting in the public house with a paper and a beer mug when the boy entered, just a child, young Spurgeon, who entered and pointing at Old Rose said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Sitting with the ungodly, you, a member of the church, you, breaking your pastor's heart. I'm ashamed of you. I wouldn't break my pastor's heart, I'm sure. And that little child walked out. And he literally or spiritually killed Old Rhodes. And Old Rhodes got right with God. There's a reproof, which is a mild, you're doing wrong, what you're doing is wrong, or rebuke, you need to change what you're doing. That comes from the Word of God. That's what Paul said to Timothy to preach. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke. God told them to preach that way. But what do they want today to fill up the churches? They want their ears tickled. They want the itch, they want the itching scratched. They want to be pleased. The third part is exhort. Exhort just simply means you've been told what's right, now do it. In the world famous words of a famous philosopher, get her done. Isaiah chapter 58 says. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, 
and show my people their transgressions in the house of Jacob their sins. When I was a student in college, one of my mentors was Dr. Richard Rupp. Dr. Rupp said that when you preach the Word of God, have a sense of urgency about that message. He said, if you don't have an urgency about that message, how do you expect people that are listening to have a sense of urgency about it? It's like this. A man's walking in his neighborhood, and he sees the downstairs of a house on fire. And there's a man upstairs in that house, the people upstairs in that house that he knows are asleep in the bed. And somehow or another, maybe he takes a stone and taps the window, gets the man's attention. And the man opens his window, and the passerby looks up at the window, and he says this to him. I don't know if you realize this, but spontaneous combustion has taken place in the lower corners of your dwelling place. Technically speaking, if you can just hold on for a little bit with me and understand what I'm trying to say, is that there's a problem, and it affects you. He's not going to do that. He's going to say, Your house is on fire! Get out! That's what he's going to say. But so much preaching today is so over everybody's head, they don't know. I decided 30-some years ago that I got sick of seeing people looking at their watches or looking at their clocks. I got so sick of hearing preachers give guilt trips to people that say, you can pay attention to a ball game for three hours. Why can't you pay attention to a sermon? I was thinking to myself while I was hearing that preacher and doing the same thing, the ball game is interesting. And it shouldn't be that hard to make the greatest book in the world interesting. But it's not just the preacher's responsibility, it's our responsibility as well. D.L. Mooney preached, what think ye of Christ? Because Jesus Christ asked the same question. R.A. Torrey preached, ten reasons why I believe the Bible to be the word of God. Because he was convinced of its truth. Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached, his goal was, he said, to preach the whole counsel of God. The message of Jesus Christ was to glorify the Father. He said in John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He said, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. Paul told the Ephesian elders, I have kept back nothing profitable for you. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. The Old and New Testament. We must preach. You need to know what biblical preaching is. Because the world is telling you that biblical preaching is preaching that meets your emotional needs. We must preach the entire Word of God, the counsel of God's Word. We must preach on holiness, whether you want to hear it or not. You preach on holiness, and you're called a Pharisee. Holiness is in the Word of God. God says to preach on it. We need to preach on love, joy, peace. We need to preach on separation from the world. We need to preach on adultery, repentance, Christ-likeness, child-rearing, faith, sin, eternity, salvation. We need to preach on heaven, and we need to preach on hell. I was encouraged 30-some years ago by a man that said, most people, even in Bible-believing churches, if you ask them to raise their hand, and I'm not going to do that, have never heard an entire sermon on hell. He said, I challenge you to preach one sermon on hell at least one sermon a year. And I took that challenge up with him. Gypsy Smith said, and that was at the turn of the century, he said, there's nothing wrong with America that 12 months of every pulpit in America preaching hellfire and brimstone can't solve. We're a whole lot worse off than, than at that time, but we still need. We need the whole counsel of God. And by the way, God-honoring preaching is not measured by the number of listeners. It is measured by the Word of God. Preaching should draw attention to God's mandates and is used of the Holy Scripture in revival and repentance. John Knox, 
was a Scottish reformer. Before that, he was a Roman Catholic vicar. Vicar, however you say that. I know, brother, every time I use the word Septuagint, somebody corrects me and says Septuagint. Every time I use the word Septuagint, somebody corrects me and says Septuagint. There are certain words, I don't know if it matters, but some people are really sticklers on how they're pronounced. I don't know if it's vicar or vicar, but he was one of those in Hearth, Scotland. He read Luther and Calvin. I don't agree with everything of either one of those men, but they had some good things. He read Luther and Calvin, and he realized that his own religion was not in line with the Bible. He realized that he was believing in a salvation that he had to work for, and they were talking about a salvation that was provided through Jesus Christ and him alone. He, he trusted Christ as his Savior. He became a born-again Christian. John Knox, after he accepted Christ as his personal Savior, was still the vicar in the Roman Catholic Church. What do I do now that I believe I put my faith in Jesus Christ that he paid it all. What do I do now? I have to go preach. So I, he goes back to his church and he preaches. And he preaches a message he takes as his text, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. I grew up Catholic. I stuttered a lot as a kid. Matter of fact, you couldn't even understand me talking, and sometimes I had to stutter when I did this. But I stuttered. But as I grew up as a Catholic... I was preaching salvation. I was believing salvation by, uh, by works. And when I trusted Christ as my personal Savior, I believed salvation was totally of Christ. Nothing I could do. There was a time as a pastor about 25 years ago, I was in a town about 45 minutes away from where I was pastoring, and I saw a Catholic bookstore there. I thought, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to check out what there is. So I walked into the Catholic bookstore, and I was looking around, and I found the Ten Commandments. And I found that the Ten Commandments they had were different than the Ten Commandments I find in the Bible in Exodus chapter 20. The difference was they took out the one about graven image. And they made, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's goods, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. They made it into two. I started thinking about, well, why would they do that? Then I remembered a trip to my brother's in-laws. We were ministering in northeast Pennsylvania, and most of my family was in southwestern Pennsylvania, and when we came out, if nobody had a place for us to stay, we had to get a motel. If we came out for a family function, one time we came out and my brother's in-laws were gone. So he said, you stay at their house. When I went to their house, they had statues of saints. They called saints. These statues, there was one in the driveway that you pray to as you're backing out of the driveway. There's one in the living room, one in the kitchen to pray, pray for over meals. There was every room of the house. We went downstairs, and there was some downstairs. They had a game room downstairs. But there was another room downstairs in which there was an altar. And you would kneel, you would sit down at the altar, and then you would look straight ahead, and you would, there was something to kneel on, and you would pray. And there was a gigantic picture of Mary, probably this big. So they would pray to Mary. Right beside the picture of Mary, I don't know why, but it was a picture of John Wayne. So, I like some of his movies. 
But uh, I didn't have any desire to pray to him. So I began to understand why they had their Ten Commandments that way. Here, John Knox, the starter of the Reformation, preaches his first time after receiving Jesus Christ. He's in a Catholic church. He takes the text, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. His church walls were lined with images. They were on pedestals with an image on top. Each side, the back, the front. He preached his text with emphasis. He reproved, rebuked, and exhorted them. He finished his sermon. He announced the benediction. He was never told, now you got to go shake hands. He just walked off. The congregation stood there for ten minutes longer, almost like they were rooted to the floor. Finally, one realized that he just heard a truth from God and that that truth must be obeyed. He ran to the first image he could find. He grabbed that image off the pedestal and he broke it on the floor. Next thing you know, people from all over the congregation ran to the nearest image and took them off the, off the pedestals and broke them on the floor. And it was the start of the Scottish Reformation. And people started being saved by grace through faith in Christ, not in works. God chose the preaching of the Word of God to do it. Preaching puts God and man in their rightful places. God is supremacy. Man is subordinate. Any preaching that esteems man and his felt needs is not of God. Any preaching that esteems man and his needs is not of God. We preach the word. The word will meet our needs as we see in the word. 1 Corinthians one twenty nine that no flesh should glory. In his presence. Anything that minimizes biblical preaching is not of God. 1 Corinthians 1.21 For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Preaching pleases God. He is pleased to use it to save souls, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort his people. You've heard some things this week. You've been reproved of some things, rebuked of some things, and exhorted in others. Now it's your responsibility to take the word of God and go with it and get her done. Evangelistic type of preaching has more of an emphasis on illustration and application than your regular preaching that you would hear Sunday by Sunday. The purpose of that is God called some pastors and some evangelists and so forth, and one of the purposes of you being here on a weekly basis is so you be edified in the Word of God, your discernment increases, your understanding of the principles of God's Word increase. You've been challenged this week to know for sure you're saved. You were showed that the Word of God teaches you what it means to be saved. You were given an illustration about repentance if you're not saved. That means that you do not know Christ as your Savior. You do not know where you're going to be when you die. There's no better, better time than tonight to settle that issue between you and God. If you're a Christian this week, you've been challenged to tell others we took a lot of excuses and threw them away and gave you reasons why you should win others to Christ. What are you going to do with the preaching of God's Word? God's Word to the people as they are. And we are responsible to how we respond to it. Let's pray.